Welcome back. We will now shift gears to session two titled Applications of AI, which will explore how AI is transforming, challenging, and operationally changing a wide range of domains from science to medicine to art. We will hear in this session from three speakers, followed by a moderated conversation and an audience Q&A. Our speakers in this session are Professor Alan Aspuru Guzik, Professor of Chemistry and Computer Science at the University of Toronto, Canada 150 Research Chair in Theoretical and Quantum Chemistry, Canada CIFAR AI Chair at the Vector Institute, and co-founder of Zapata Computing and Kebotics. Professor Suchi Saria, John C. Mellon, Associate Professor of Computer Science at the Whiting School of Engineering, and of Statistics and Health Policy at the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University, and CEO and founder of Bayesian Health. And Pindar van Armen, an AI artist who develops and works with robots to create R and explore the question of creativity. And our moderator for this session is Tom Simonite, senior writer at Wired, where he covers artificial intelligence and its effects on the world. It is now my pleasure to pass the virtual floor to Alan. Thank you, Ido. Uh, this is a ple pleasure to be here. Um, in 11 minutes, I'll try to give you uh, an overview of AI for science in, as, it, as, as it pertains to my research and many of my friends and collaborators. In particular, I'll be telling you about what is called self-driving laboratories and the need for an accelerating scientific discovery. This plot, it, we, are, we look at it so much that we're desensitized to it in some sense. We only have a decade to reduce carbon emissions by a half to be able to make it, okay? You can see here how much we need to emit to be able to get to one and a half Celsius. And that will require, of course, a lot of political action, a lot of technical action, but hopefully acceleration of science as well. So um, why do we want to accelerate science? Imagine that a material was needed for a critical aspect of climate change. The traditional time it takes to commercialize a material from idea to market is about 25 years and hundreds of millions of dollars, okay? Perhaps if you're optimistic, 10 years and $10 million is what you have to think about, okay? This is the process. And the reason this process takes so long is because there are different silos in the, in the, in the, in the, in, in the process of, from simulation all the way to manufacture. My thesis and the thesis of several other scientists is that we could potentially get a factor of 10 here by rethinking the process and inserting artificial intelligence, which is a topic of the symposium, and automation, which is also a big, big driver of the technological, uh, the technological driver of the century in the process of discovery all the way up to scaling. And that will allow us to make, design, and test more samples that are ideated or created by a computer. This, my talk is going to be followed two talks from now from Pindar, which is going to be telling us about creativity in art. And there's a lot of connections between coming up with a new molecule and coming up with a new painting. So stay tuned for his talk. So what do we like to call a self-driving laboratory? It's an, it's an image reminding of the self-driving car. As the data comes in, the self-driving car has to make immediate decisions about where to go. Okay, so the road is turning, another car is coming in the front, and you have to stop and accelerate and move around it. Unlike high throughput virtual screening or high throughput screening, traditional tools that farmer material science have used over the years, self-driving labs use data and Bayesian models, which by the way, this connects to Sushi's talk because uh, Sushi is gonna, uh, she's a co-founder of a company called Bayesian Medicine, right? So Bayesian decision-making allows to actually on the fly decide what to do next in the laboratory. So many people around the world and myself have been working really hard on doing this type of science to accelerate discovery. And of course, with um, a lot of uh, uh, efforts come recognition and pressure. Uh, you know, Tom Simonite from MIT Technology, sorry, Tom Simonite from Wire here, um, uh, covers this space and also MIT Technology Review. And here MIT Technology Review uh, mentioned these four organizations I take part of as part of the people in the ecosystem for AI discovered molecules and availability three to five years, no pressure. 
but definitely we need to take that speed, okay? And uh, I'm gonna tell you an example. I, I actually advise and work together with this company called In Silico AI. And in, in, 19, in 2019, we were able to, in, in about 40 days, use a computer to generate ideas, the same way Pinder will tell you about computers generating paintings, the same methodology, to generate ideas for drug candidates. In this particular case, an inhibitor for DDR1 kinases, which is basically uh, a muscular dystrophy candidate, okay? And you can see here the pipeline. This is a computer using AI to generate many candidates that are run by many, many, many filters. And then with the help of a company called Gushi, we were able to parallelize and do many, many uh, you know, cell, organ, and then animal tests, okay? So you might wonder, okay, what happened to in silico? Well, a couple of years later, they identified a new target also for, for dystrophy, a new drug, and just raised $550 million in the latest round. So this is a company that is rapidly growing uh, based on this technology. What's happening in my lab is we're keeping this idea of dreaming materials, so dreaming molecules, okay? This, uh, again, the analogy with the paintings will make it clear later in this, in, in, in this, in this talk. For example, for trying to come up with catalysts for taking CO2 from the atmosphere or splitting water, which are very important energy problems. And this is a paper with our collaborator Yu Sung Yoon from last year, where we showed how can you, we can use these generative models of AI to propose new oxide materials. These are solid state materials. For sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, we need materials that are very porous and very spongy. So in this other paper that appeared this year in Nature Machine Intelligence, my lab and I were able to actually show how AI can come up with these materials that can separate CO2 from air. So that sounds pretty good, but the remainder of this talk is gonna be about how to make them. And that is the idea of the self-driving laboratory or Martillas acceleration platform. For the audience, you can see several papers and reports that we wrote on this subject. Uh, actually under the Paris Climate Agreement uh, and the Mission Innovation Framework, we were one of the seven missions in the world uh, called Materials Acceleration Platforms. And I'm gonna show you just one example. My lab is involved in several, tens of them, but this is one that is also connected to drug discovery. We all have been thinking about COVID and I show you one where we're discovering a new lead candidate, but then you have to optimize how the candidate is synthesized. And this is a collaboration with Merck and led by my collaborators at the University of British Columbia here, we're trying to maximize the E to C ratio, the ratio of two potential products on the scale up of the production of a drug. And we use these Bayesian models to take a look at this experimental system. And this is uh, Melody, Melody Christensen added this Instagram filter of little magic. This is the AI magic controlling the robot as the robot is doing experiments. On the right hand side, you see the experimental de collection data points and our interface to talk to the robot, which is also very important is natural language through Slack. Like if you were texting your friend, okay? You tell the robot, start an experiment, stop an experiment. And after 200 experiments, don't worry about the details. We optimize categorical and continuous variables that gave us a, a, a selectivity of 70%, which is better than a human took in about six months and a half, which means in just a couple of rounds, this experiment outsmarted the humans at producing a drug candidate, okay? This is a very important aspect of drug discovery. Now, let's end with a futuristic note. What's coming up, right? Um, ideally, what we want is a Terminator-like robot, right? That is in the lab working with you doing chemistry. So my lab and I are thinking about also other aspects of computer uh, uh, science and also AI and machine learning that could allow us to actually make progress. And this is an example uh, you can see here uh, uh, the largest data set that we built of transparent objects in two dimensions from pictures that we took from Instagram, from Twitter, all sorts of different sources, including Chemical Engineering News, a magazine of powders, foams, and liquids that allows us to actually try to do what I'm doing right now here. I'm drinking my iced tea here uh, with this transparent object and look how carefully I can just drink it. A robot cannot do that yet. So with this data set, we're able to do things like this. Let me show you this YouTube video. Oh, if it cooperates, uh, let me show you this YouTube video. Oh, it's not working. Well, that what, what's happening with this, with this lady, she's actually 
pouring a liquid on, on the fly. And you can see here how we detect the, 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 what is a vessel, there is no solids and the liquids. That's extremely important. And I have to say now at the University of Toronto with Annie Meshgar, Florence Kruti, and my student Hao Peng Xu, we have the world record, even better than companies like NVIDIA or, or Intel, uh, companies of that type, we have the, the best data set and also performance on the detection of transparent glassware in crowded environments, okay? This allows us to think about robotic arms that carry out chemistry in a very unsupervised fashion. They will actually go ahead, pick up uh, glasses, wherever they are, measure the volume just by taking pictures of it. These are a combination of RGB pictures and depth sensors. And of course, respond to natural language so that you can actually tell them, for example, which is gonna be our next project, mix me a Negroni, but also can you please carry out this radioactive chemical reaction, right? And not uh, kill a human. Finally, for my remaining minutes or so, I would like to actually tell you about an uh, initiative that maybe, maybe some people in the audience are interested. At the University of Toronto, we're building a very large consortium called the Acceleration Consortium. Industry, government, and academia, it's global in nature. So we welcome people from industry, academics around the world uh, to join us in accelerating science in general, okay? In particular, we're focusing on materials, drugs, uh, and, and chemicals. But of course, we have connections to many other areas, such as biomanufacturing. And the idea is to make the world able to print, so to speak, and design materials on demand, entering an era of materials of demand that will be the next era beyond the era of plastics. And with that, I'm going to show you a picture of my research group in 2D Zoom world and our first in-person retreat uh, a couple of weeks ago in Northern Ontario. And with that, uh, I'm going to thank you for your attention, and I'm going to stop sharing and uh, look forward to listening to uh, Professor Sushi Saria, which is going to tell us next about uh, how AI can transform medicine. Thanks, Alan. Um, I can't see the audience here, but I, I feel very excited by everything Alan just presented. It seemed like he was running at twice the pace than he was thinking. So it was, it was pretty cool. And I feel like um, AI in medicine is sort of moving at a similarly insane pace, which means it's actually like um, kind of pretty, it's exciting enough that I feel like I have trouble sleeping at night. And so it's been really, really fun. I'll tell you a little bit about some of the progress we've made, the field fields made. Um, so I got into the field AIML almost 20 years ago as a very young, um, uh, undergrad um, and only got into medicine about 12 years ago. And I think there hasn't been a more exciting time for making um, an impact on medicine using AI. So let me sort of explain why. So uh, starting with like in medicine, diagnostic errors is the third leading cause of death. So it's not can like, you know, it's not sort of any particular disease, but the fact that like you know, patients get delayed diagnosis, misdiagnosis, undertreated, overtreated, and and these many of these are life threatening. Um, and uh, simultaneously, there's stats that show that a quarter of healthcare spent today is maybe unnecessary and could be avoidable. So staggering statistics in a very 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 important area. Now the question is, what does AI have anything to do with it? A thing that happened, this is while I was early in my graduate school days, uh, I realized was, you know, like there were some very big regulatory changes that were happening that was gonna change how the field practice. So one was the High Tech Act in 2009, the Affordable Care Act in 2010, which meant suddenly medicine went from being a field which was mostly practiced on paper records where you go in and people are recording things on paper to suddenly everything had to be digitized. And as soon as digitization was introduced, you suddenly had like data about patients, their symptoms, their um, you know, procedures that were done, um, medications that are given, which now allows us to study longitudinally um, uh, diseases or syndromes as they're developing and use that kind of rich data to start identifying what are early signs and indicators or what's happening to be able to uh, identify patients at risk for particular complications early, uh, put in new types of preventative and pro prophylactic workflows in place um, that allow you to practice medicine much more proactively. So that's the thing that's fascinated me. And I've, um, over the last 
12 years, uh, sort of spent all my time thinking about this area. And um, let me step back a little bit and tell you about kind of where we sit from a machine learning AI standpoint. So obviously the digitization has introduced a huge amount of excitement for the space to be able to come up with new AI ML algorithms. The hard part has been three things. So first, this data is a whole lot more messy than typical other areas where we've used MLAI. So for instance, when we look at domains like, you know, surveillance, like face detection, or, you know, on Facebook, when you're recognizing who your friends are on the images, that sort of thing. When you're coming to medicine, you don't have data from one sensor. It's not just an image, it's images, it's notes. It's lots of different sensors, like heart rate, blood pressure, um, labs. So suddenly you're integrating hundreds of different types of sensors and each of these sensors have their own biases and they're recorded at different levels and intervals, which means in order to integrate these data and to, uh, to draw inferences that are reliable, trustworthy, uh, you need methods and techniques that can really, and strategies that can handle the kind of messiness um, that has to do with the data. Um, so that's sort of been, one big area for progress in the last five years, um, you know, as a professor at Hopkins, uh, part of a large lab there, where we basically have brought together new ideas uh, from using causal inference, Bayesian methodology, to be able to integrate data and uh, forecast, um, uh, not just sort of what we think is happening, but also uncertainty, like understanding what we know and what we don't know, understanding why we know what we know in order to be able to build the right kind of interfaces that, um, you know, uh, when we are starting to support expert decision-making, they, they're willing to trust the outputs, which means me to my second topic, which is as, um, and I'll use an example. So like an area where I've done a lot of work um, is um, uh, sepsis. It's the 10th leading cause of death in, um, uh, um, nationally, actually internationally. And um, turns out uh, sepsis is entirely preventable if, or in many sepsis deaths are preventable if only you could have identified them early. But early detection of sepsis is hard. And uh, uh, in 2015, we wrote a paper that was uh, a cover article in Science Translational Medicine showing how you could integrate diverse data that exists, that's already routinely collected to be able to identify sepsis early. Um, and now the challenge there is, how do we go from feasibility, which is we can identify it early to get it to a robust system that physicians will trust, right? Because now you're going from um, you know, a scenario where um, it's sort of machine learning is feasible to machine learning is augmented human experts, right? But they've spent years studying the problem. And in order to build that, turns out it's not just the prediction, it's, it's the quality of the predictions, how domain aware they are, how rigorously they've been evaluated for actionability. And then it's also how it's surfaced and fed in a way so that it's easy to collaborate. So what does it mean to collaborate? It's collaborate meaning um, the expert knows why you're telling me what you're telling me. The expert knows how to think about when to trust you and not to trust you. The expert knows how to integrate what you're telling them in their own decision-making process. Um, and that's been some of the advances that's been very exciting, a continually evolving field. Um, as part of collaborations funded through the National Science Foundation, we've been advancing under this whole area called the future of the human workforce, which is as we continue to, you know, as data continues to double, how do we use new technologies like MLAI to actually augment experts to help them do better what they um, what they can do. So now let me talk a little bit about practical results. So over the, um, you know, from back in 2015, where I talked about showing feasibility, we ran into all of these hurdles as we started translating into the field. And what we found was, you know, we had to develop a system that could integrate live clinical data streams, run these inferences, do experiments to surface these to actual physicians we now have thousands of physicians, clinic, uh, nurses and uh, doctors using these tools. And what we've been able to achieve, so 16, 14, 15 weeks ago, we came out with a study, one of the largest studies of, it kind, of its kind, um, where we uh, scan 500,000 patients through the software, um, 4,000 plus providers using the system. And what we were able to show was basically um, 
you know, sustained over a period of two plus years, very high physician adoption. So this is actually quite hard. So typically in uh, with AI ML tools in medicine, one of the big bottlenecks or with any predictive tools or any uh, what they're called clinical decision assist tools, one of the big bottlenecks has been, you know, people process the data and they sort of spew up some flag, but, you know, providers don't trust it, like doctors don't trust it, they don't want to use it. Um, and so, you know, we've had to solve a number of these problems to cut through this trust barrier. And um, what we were able to show was 89% um, provider adoption, which means 89% of the times when, um, and so this is software developed by the startup Bayesian, which we spun out of Hopkins, but basically uh, the software kind of flags patients at risk for adverse events like sepsis. And when we flag a patient, uh, physicians come in, they, uh, they, it's not mandatory, but they come in, they analyze what the system has to say, they put an evaluation and they're, you know, they agree, disagree and treat. Um, so it's been a really exciting journey to be able to go from uh, models in the lab where we're discovering novel techniques for being able to identify how to cut through the messy, to tackle the messiness of this data to get to high quality inferences, to being able to put it in the field with um, embedded within physician workflows in a way that now they're adopting it, using it, and now we're seeing clinical benefits. So in sepsis, every hour delay in mortality has been reported to be anywhere between five to eight percent increase associated with five to eight percent increase in um, mortality. And what we were able to show was significant reduction in uh, you know uh, time to antibiotics, which is a metric that uh, in the field is used to identify. Our patients actually getting detected early and our providers using it to be able to treat them earlier. And we saw on average, uh, patients were getting treatments on average about two hours earlier than they otherwise would from the use of AI ML technology here. Okay, so what are the other barriers in the field? So what I'm describing is I think only a starting point for what is an end-to-end -end chassis for being able to leverage the vast amount of medical data that is now being available and using that medical data to learn from best practices. So what are the, you know, we, there's an opportunity to learn from physician variation, from practice variation, um, you know, where the, like what are the uh, like practices that are leading to the best outcomes and then scaling that practice. So that's one, but also being able to just uncover things that providers don't know by basically being able to learn what predicts what, right? If we can identify early signs, it allows us to uncover new signs that previously uh, weren't known. And now the hard part is, uh, you know, um, interestingly combining all that to be able to deliver novel solutions in novel clinical areas. Um, so we now, uh, in the last uh, year and a half, started scaling this kind of uh, approach to multiple clinical areas and are seeing success in multiple clinical areas. And one of my biggest, biggest, um, sort of uh, realizations has been the under appreciation for evaluation. So as methodologists, as model developers, as algorithmists, we love coming up with a new idea. So we sit in a lab, we see a problem, we dream up a new idea, we come up with a new algorithm, we take a data set and we show A problems better than B. But to take it in the real world and to deeply understand if it's working in the real world, there's more than one or two single metrics like AUC, sensitivity, specificity, like measuring it in the real world means really understanding, are you measuring the metrics correctly? What metrics are you measuring? And uh, you have to have deep domain appreciation, which is sort of a highly like deep domain awareness, understanding and appreciation to understand, are you measuring the right metrics well? And um, believe it or not, I think um, my experience has been, it takes one unit of work to develop. If it takes one unit of work to develop the algorithm, it takes nine units of work to actually create a system that is to, to that is well evaluated and, and uh, rigorously validated. And, and that's not just sort of, uh, and people often think of evaluations as one and done, which means, um, you know, you, you sort of have a data set, you can uh, measure the quality of the algorithms on a data set, and then if it shows it works, you're happy. In reality, when you're moving things to the real world, you want to think a lot about, um, you know, uh, all the ways in which the real world is stochastic. There are all these drifts and shifts that happen in the real world because populations are changing, practice patterns are changing, the way the data is being collected are changing. And uh, as a result, algorithm efficacy also has to be continuously monitored and measured in the real world. 
Um, and But having said all this, the thing that I find extremely exciting is I think we're at a very cool time where you know, the end-to-end -end chassis now exists. We're seeing early signs of results in the field with providers adopting it. We're seeing early signs of, um, you know, end-to-end uh, -end chassis for scaling up the deployment of new clinical algorithms. And uh, clinical infrastructure at a, at a, as a whole is at a place where it's possible to disseminate this through the adoption of electronic health records, uh, which are platforms that uh, providers now use to practice medicine. So I'm, um, come if, if you're interested in this space, I highly encourage you to look deeper. I think there's so many problems to be solved. And then also, um, you know, uh, Bayesian Health, which is sort of a company we started to, to accelerate the development and deployment of these kinds of algorithms is uh, also happy to sort of partner with more people in all walks of life to advance this area. Oh, hello. Um... This is, I get, I get so into these talks. I'm a Pindar Van Arman artist and I, I've been using AI for a little bit to make art. You can see a bunch of it behind me, everything from abstract to straight up portraits. And, and I, I always feel lucky when I, when I hear these things because I see other practitioners of AI, they have really big stakes. You know, I, I heard about, we need to solve global warming, you know, and, and I couldn't imagine using AI and medicine and this, you know, the stakes of having, decisions made by these machines and, and diagnosis is like lives depend on it. Uh, I chose art because, well, I like art, but also because, you know, the worst thing that can happen is I make something really ugly and I, I don't show it to anyone. So I'm going to show you today and I'm going to go, like Alon mentioned, like how to go ahead and uh, I'm going to show you how my robots think and how they try and be creative in this whole process I have my all my art is about me trying to dissect my own creativity and teach it to machines and then a process learn about my own creativity um, so let's go ahead and uh, I'll walk you through uh, my process so the one of the things is uh, a big controversy is whether or not uh, AI can make art and I absolutely do not think it can and I don't think it will be able to until it's sentient because art is something made the, the whatever makes the art has to declare it art and so until AI is doing that independently it's not making art but I do think it can be creative and I stumbled into this uh, I got into making robot paintings because I just had children and um, and because I had just had children all of a sudden I had no time to paint and so I had this like great idea I'm going to make robots that help me paint um, and these are the first ones, just like, and, and they were printers. They weren't much better than printers, um, except they printed with paintbrushes. And um, I went ahead and uh, made them get as realistic as possible. Then I went to impressionism. And then I started getting into deep learning. Um, and, the, and with the deep learning, it started being truly creative. Uh, but how? This is, this is a quick synopsis of how it thinks and how it makes images and it's trying to imagine and paint a face and, and I, I subscribe to the um, the Minsky model of, of a creative uh, or I'm sorry a, a society of minds where like our mind isn't our brain isn't just one mind but hundreds maybe thousand maybe ten thousand different minds I, I have no idea but all these agents these agents fighting with each other for control of our thoughts um, and there's a lot of evidence for that, but here it is. It's like, you know, I have all these different AI algorithms, 24 running at the moment, uh, and they're all fighting for control of the, the paintbrush. But what do they do? The uh, biggest key here is there's also these things called creative feedback loops. And I heard about feedback loops first from artist uh, Paul Clay, and he described an artist as someone that, you know, you make some marks on a canvas and you take a step back, see what the effects the mark had. Uh, on the art and then you make some more marks and you take a step back and you and you make these back and forth where you analyze what you're doing over and over again and and at micro and macro levels and my robots do that exactly you know they're they're using all these ai agents and every so often they uh, stop take a picture and then and all the ai agents uh, fight with each other for the next step i'm not going to go into all 24 some are very simple like k means clustering just like you know cluster parts of the image into colors um, and then it goes all the way to um, the most complex ones I'm using right now are GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks that uh, Alan mentioned earlier. And that's what we're going to go into uh, in detail uh, with. But, but before we go into detail, you know, what is the reception of this art? Like, you know, does it pass muster? Um, and I've had the good fortune of being uh, reviewed by Jerry Saltz, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning art critic. 
And uh, he actually has gone on the record and say it doesn't look like a computer made it. That's all I ever tell anyone usually when I'm advertising my work because he finished that sentence with that doesn't make it any good. But, you know, it's like Hollywood. You just you just keep the part of the quote that uh, makes advantage. But computers and paintings and, and AI art, and, and I've he heard about the similar, but I'm not an expert in poetry, writing. Um, they're passing, you know, like we have this idea of a Turing test and they're passing Turing tests left and right. You really can't tell the difference between AI making art, uh, paintings, um, and humans making paintings anyway, just can't. Uh, people are constantly surprised that uh, my robots come up with some of the images they come up with. So to go into detail, you know, how did the uh, robot uh, imagine this face? It is, you know, admittedly an abstract face and that was on purpose, but you know, let's, how did it come up with this image that I guess looks like uh, an abstraction of a face? And this is where we get into the details of a generative adversarial network. And um, the goal of this description is to just get it across. You know, I, I always thought to myself, if I could explain this to my parents um, who have no experience in uh, AI, then I've done a good job. And that's what, that's what I've really tried to do here. So first of all, you know, just let's go to the basics. A neural network is, you know, a mathematical construct or a model of how our brain works. And I was lucky enough to get permission to use the slide on the left. And that's that's actual live recording of neuronal activity given to me by Michelle uh, Koikendall and, and Gareth, uh, or permission given to me by uh, Michelle Koikendall and, and Gareth Kavanison to uh, show it. And if you look at the mathematical model on the right, you know, you can see the similarities. There's things going from nodes uh, there's weights, there's things firing. Um, luckily, I'm an artist, so I, I don't know all the technical names for what's going on, and, and I don't have to, but I see the similarities. And how does this work? The cool thing about this is I can get them to work, and I've ridden neural nets, and I've, I've ridden CNNs and GANs, but I don't understand how they work. And, and I have a lot of uh, computer science friends that they too admit they don't understand how it works. They just know that it works and there's a way to train them. And specifically in this convolutional neural network, um, you, can, you can train it uh, on a whole set of image and, and you have classifications for the images. And then when you come up with a new image, you can feed it right in and it'll give you a, a probabilistic prediction of what that is. In this case, this is one I wrote and, and I've come up with a 65% pick, uh, chance that that um, bridge on the left there, the Golden Gate Bridge is a bridge. Google's models are through the roof. I mean, I think that they can like predict with 99 plus percent accuracy. Um, some uh, some models I've heard is beyond human parity. Uh, the the models are predicting better than human. Can look at a picture and tell you everything in the picture better than a human can. Um, so that's that's a CNN. We're not into generative uh, GANs yet. So what is a generative adversarial network? And I showed you the CNN because that's kind of important to how a, a generative adversarial network works. But a generative adversarial network is not one but two neural networks. Um, one of them is called the discriminator. And like, you know, to keep this non-technical, I want you to think of the discriminator as an art critic. This guy has studied, and in this case specifically, this is an art critic that specializes in portraits. And this guy has studied thousands, 10, actually, you know, specifically, I'll tell you how much this guy has studied, 10,000 pictures of celebrities um, from very popular data set. And it knows the patterns uh, that makes up a celebrity's face. Um, those are some of the things. So if you show them the bridge, it does the thing I just showed you, uh, the calculation I just showed you, and it knows that's not a bridge. It's like, that's not a bridge. You show him a picture of my son, it says, absolutely, that's a portrait. And so this can, this discriminator can discriminate between not a portrait and is a portrait. And uh, and that's it. All right, um, it gets much more technical than that, but I'm trying to keep it uh, simple so my parents would understand here. So the other one, that's the discriminator. The other one here is the generator. And the generator, I like to think of as an artist, a really free spirited artist that has, you know, just likes to create and very abstract even, just like has no rules. Um, and in this case, is very naive, doesn't even know what a portrait looks like. And so we asked this generator, is like, hey, can you make us a portrait? And its first try looks something like that. There's no, I mean, I don't see a portrait in there and I don't expect anyone, but this artist, this generator doesn't care. It says, hey, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm just making portraits and it shows the discriminator or the critic. It's like, what do you think of my portrait? The critic takes a look at it, thumbs down. There's no portrait in there. But it does something subtle here. Um, it gives a little bit of critique. It says to the generator, you know, 
I don't see a portrait in there, but here, let me share a little bit of my statistical model of what a portrait should look like and, and passes that on to the generator and the generator takes the feedback and says, okay, okay, I get you. How about this? You know, I took your input and I took your critique and I made this portrait. And once again, the, um, the critic is gonna look at this and say, I don't see a portrait there, but you know what? Something's going on. I don't know what, but here, let, let me give you some more pointers. Artist tries again, critic says, nobody says, hey, look, bottom right there, I see a little bit of a forehead. Oh, I'm sorry, bottom center, I see a little bit of forehead. Uh, artist tries again, I'm sorry, the generator tries again, the discriminator says no. Um, the generator tries again, and then this time the discriminator says, well, it's getting close. I'm starting to see shapes, subtle shapes. Gives more input back to the generator. The generator adjusts its statistical model again. Uh, at 440 iterations, we start seeing the outlines of faces, but the discriminator is still not convinced. 600, you're seeing, I'm seeing faces. Discriminator is thinking about 1,100. And finally, what was that? At 4,000 iterations, the faces look this good. Um, and what's interesting is these faces were generated from the artist with no, no input other than like, you know, like adjust your statistical model. So this artist has never seen a face and it was still able to do this. And if you look up NVIDIA, you know, I heard Alon compared to NVIDIA, they're always considered the gold standard. So it's very impressive that Alon's out, his team is beating them is they have these celebrity faces that are just gorgeous, that look like celebrities. And you could swear you've seen them before and you know them, but you don't because these are completely imagined faces. So here, I'll go, oh, I should show you this animation of it going through the, the 4,000 iterations, that's it. That's the GAN trying to imagine a face. Let's see. All right. So uh, what's this? Oh, oh, yeah, this is, I go into this. This is sort of like, I like this part of the GAN because it sort of thinks like a dream to me and makes me think that this is the very beginning, right, when the faces are coming out. And the reason why this speaks to me and my art is about this is that I think this is how our imagination works. I don't know, I'm not a scientist, but it just feels right to me. It feels like when I'm asked to think of something, imagine something, I feel like it comes into my mind like this, starts off in darkness and gets more and more refined. And um, I can't help but think because of that, uh, that there might be GANs running around in our head. Um, so I hope I've done a good job of uh, describing how a GAN or generative adversarial network works. Two algorithms or two neural networks fighting with each other. Um, and you can see here my robot using those to paint this series, uh, First Parts of Artificial Creativity, a series I did about three years ago. Um, and I continue to use GANs regularly. Um, but I guess that brings me to the end of my presentation. And I guess, I don't know, is now the time to introduce Tom Simonite to lead the rest of the discussion? I'll go ahead. And... Yeah, thanks very much, Pindar. And before that, Suchi and Alain. Um, this is a great panel. You know, we've got a really varied range of backgrounds represented here you know someone with a background in machine learning and statistics a, a chemist and an artist could be the setup for a joke perhaps particularly when you throw in a, a journalist too but I, I found it interesting that you um all hit some similar notes in your talks there and uh it seems like we have a lot to talk about one thing i kind of heard you all say i don't know if you all use the word but you all sort of talked about collaborating with these tools you're using um the title of this panel is applications of AI, you know, when you apply something, it sounds like you're just sort of throwing it on top, you know, you apply paint in a, in a layer and there it is. Um, but when I hear you talk about your work, it sounds that this, you know, this really isn't just another tool. Um, scientists, artists and uh, doctors all use all kinds of software spreadsheets, you know, we're on Zoom, but it sounds like we're talking about something a bit more involved. Um, Pindal, maybe you could start. How is AI or machine learning as you use it? It's not just another tool, right? You know, artists have used different techniques and technologies yeah. over the years, but you really seem to, the way you talk about this, it's not just like another brush or another way of making a canvas or something. There's there's certain collaboration here with the tool. Yeah, yeah, no, I, um, I, I'm fortunate enough that, uh, it's interesting. It, it started off as it was, I was definitely, it was my assistant. It would do the busy work. I'd set it up like a printer and it would print um, paintings with a brush and, and paint. But now recently it's more, it's taken more of a creative role into the fact that I am its assistant. Like I will, I will give it the training data and, and I'll set up the concept, you know, the high level directorial 
uh, things. Uh, and then I'll set it going and you'll see a painting behind me right over my shoulder and you'll see all the paints. But as soon as I've set it off on its, on its creative mission to create some kind of painting, I become its assistant. I have to go mix its paints. I have to go make sure the brushes stay uh, clean. I have to like, uh, so it's like this, this role of switching where it's a complete collaboration, but at the different times, it's almost like there's three roles. Yeah, that's good. There's three roles. One is director and I would be the director directing the artwork and the other is the the technical the creative technical um artist and and that i, I didn't want to say that the creative technical uh applicator of paint and that would be the robot and then there would be the studio assistant and that would be me so it's like you know our roles are melding into each other and, and it's really interesting to see that go i was i was really interested to see what's going on in the lab i can't imagine ai doing research and looking forward to hearing more about that right yeah thank, thanks for that yeah, Alan, um, you described you know AI as, as being an accelerator of, of work in the lab and uh, use this concept of self-driving labs. You know, again, researchers in chemistry and many other fields have used technology for a long time, but you're talking about something a bit more, I don't know, actively involved in the process. Is, is there a change of mind mindset required here? It's not just yeah. like having another way of crunching the numbers. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a complete required state of mind. And I like a lot how Pinder puts it because we feel the same way, um, how we're helping our robots do things. Uh, but my lab, you can think about it as me, a computational theoretical chemist by training, running an organic synthesis lab, uh, analytical chemistry lab, and a laser physics lab all together, laser, laser spectroscopy lab all together in the same roof controlled by software, right? So we need to do similar aspects, uh, like the one Spinder talked about, have an ability to actually close the loop, like when he takes his photos, for us taking the photos is sending in lasers to the molecules and like figure out if a molecule is good or bad. And then we make choices about which molecules are next to make. And the question you might ask is, do we really accelerate science in the time scale that we're talking about? I came up with now two different uh, answers. The first one is the setup time. It took us two and a half years and about two and a half million dollars to get where we are, right? It's a prototype self-driving lab that does basically everything I told you. That is the sunk time, right? And that's something that maybe Pinder had the same. He had to build his arms and paint and all this stuff. It takes a long time to get there. Once it's running, in a weekend, we printed with, with a close loop, 40 organic molecules that are perhaps some of the best organic lasers, uh, the next technology for display in the world. Right, and the paper is being they're being tested in Japan, and hopefully we'll write a paper soon. So once the thing is going and you debug it and you assist it, then it's it's a very different uh, way of thinking of science because you create this environment where the machine is going to help you explore the space way faster. And I think the more we do that in different domains, the more we will potentially accelerate discovery in such fields. How does that feel? Like is that disorienting almost if you're used to the the old way of doing things? Um, does it require you to sort of rethink your process or even your self-conception of what a scientist is? No, it's empowering. And I think uh, I want to also riff of my artist friend talking about a writer, uh, you know, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, Argentinian writer, uh, writes about chess. And he says, uh, who is the God behind the God that moves the player, that moves the piece, that starts this game of dust and agonies? In other words, there's always going to be a scientist setting up the system that the system will do science on. So therefore, our role will still be there, no matter how we automate science. And, um, and I think that's where we're becoming. We're becoming the God behind the God. And I think it's going to be more and more fun as the humans build these machines that do medicine, art, science, and all sorts of other applications, how we can you know, move to higher levels of thinking and, 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 and basically do better things for the world in, in all aspects. Yeah, okay. I'm going to bring Suchi in uh, here in a second, but I just wanted to let the audience know that in about 10 minutes, we will switch over to uh, you asking the questions instead of me. So um, sit tight for that and get ready to type into the Q&A box. Um, Suchi, you, got, you described how in medicine, maybe of the three panelists here, you sort of have the messiest area of application. Uh, the healthcare system is so complicated. Uh, despite the big shift towards digital health records that you mentioned, um, I'm pretty sure there were still a lot of fax machines, particularly in the US health system. Um, 
And, you know, as you mentioned, there, there are very well established sort of human processes of expertise and how, how doctors think about who they will listen to and who they won't. Um, how do you tell me a little bit about, yeah, sort of getting people to sort of work with AI in this um, area? Again, you're not just giving them another piece of software to stand alongside the office suite, right? There's something more here. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, interestingly, um, as soon as we start thinking of it as, at the end of the day, physicians are clinicians, like doctors and nurses, every user is solving a problem. So we have to understand what is the problem they're solving and what aspect of the problem that they're solving our tool, our solutions are helping them solve, right? And there are solutions that are fully standalone. There are solutions that are part of a workflow. So an example is in diabetic retinopathy, like people have come up with a workflow where the idea is instead of going to the specialist where you have an eye scan and mm -hmm. from that we are going to de detect diabetic retinopathy, there's a whole new workflow where you can devise a simple tool that can be deployed at the primary care physician's office where historically they wouldn't have screened for diabetic retinopathy, but now using um, you know, a scan of an image, software can use to detect diabetic retinopathy and then patients who are at risk are then sent to the specialist, which means now people are getting caught earlier and sent to the right places, right? So whose problem were we solving here? We were solving this problem of like placing it in places where we didn't have access to certain resources or the provider didn't know how to do the same They, you know, that wasn't sort of the area of expertise and we're happy to be quote augmented from the use of technology to solve a problem they didn't, you know, that they didn't see in this real house. So similarly, in many of the clinical areas that we're tackling, there's a clear notion of like, who are the existing stakeholders? What are the problems they're struggling with? Where does the solution come in and solve a problem for them? in a way that improves their performance, improves outcomes, cuts cost. And I think this is where um, the collaboration aspect that you referred to, Tom, actually, I see showing up in two ways. One is the collaboration, the really the um, kind of the humility with which we enter and introduce something where we really understand the ecosystem and how does it play in the ecosystem to figure out who are the stakeholders, what problems need to be solved, and what are the problems this thing is solving and then sometimes done poorly, what are the problems this thing is introducing? So it better be solving a whole bunch of problems and not be introducing a whole bunch of problems, right? So that's sort of at a high level. And then the second piece of collaboration is a little bit more as developers, model developers and algorithmists, where, you know, historically people have thought of it as there's this box. They can use this box on data to get some output. And most software that you see from the use of AI today follows that paradigm. There exists a box, they've downloaded the box, they run it on some data, they get some output, and that's where it stops, right? And you present that output. But in most complex domains in the real world, where we're designing state-of-the-art software, like in medicine, we need the ability to iterate. We need the ability to learn from the behavior, from the use. We need the ability to, you know, the reason I, in my, um, my own observation of working in this field has been that we, we, when we first use the box as is, in 95% of those cases, the box wasn't very useful or good. What was necessary was all the iterations and advances we had to make to be able to bring um, you know, domain awareness, deep understanding of the messiness, to be able to improve strategies and true strategies that really marry the complexity of the domain. And that's real collaboration with the AI, right? It's collaboration with the AI, the stakeholders, the use, the data. Yeah, I mean, what you described sounds a lot like uh, Pindar's artistic process, in fact. And uh, it's interesting to think about <laughs> applying that in other areas as well. Um, okay, and so do we, I mean, the three of you, I suppose, have been, you've ended up on this panel because you're in the vanguard. You, you've shown that it's possible to use the technology in this way in your fields. Uh, before most others, based on your experience, I mean, do you think is is everyone in, in every field, it doesn't matter what it is, like going to have to get used to this technology or or, or start to apply it? Alain, I mean, in, in science, you opened with that slide um, about our uh, a little climate problem here on planet Earth. Um, that's not just a chemistry problem, right? Uh, it's going to require all kinds of advances. So, I mean, is every scientific field going to start to look a bit more self-driving? I think that 
that's what we're building our consortium, right? Science has to be accelerated across the board and science has to realize, every scientist across the world, that every data point is valuable, right? Every single observation is valuable to do the next decision. And because we scientists are trained to do science like in the 19th century, where we kind of get the next direction based on a lot of redundant and not so useful data points, then we are not doing science as quickly as we could. So absolutely, I think Edo is an astronomer. He probably, or an astrophysicist, he could, he, they, they, in that field, there could be some progress, but pretty much almost in every field. And therefore why, that's why I think uh, how we train our, science, our future scientists is important, how we talk to the public, how we involve the companies. And a last example I will make, um, just a challenge to my colleagues and material scientists. I am in awe of Moderna and Pfizer. They spent, of course, decades building a technology, but they were able to, from, from the, seeing the problem to scale up in a year, scale up to worldwide scale, right? That is just incredible. And I, I argue that material scientists and many other scientists around the world, we don't have the infrastructure and we don't have the mindset as what our pharma colleagues taught us, right? So that is the next goal. Imagine that all the clatterates of methane in the planet start emitting methane at once. And we have to figure out a way of removing all the methane in the atmosphere in a year, just as a hypothetical. How are you gonna do that? What is the catalyst? How are you gonna scale the production of it, et cetera? So that's what keeps me up at night. And I think you should keep all the scientists at, at night because uh, connecting to Suchi's work, what if there's a new bacteria that is gonna start doing sepsis to all the humans in the planet? Is she gonna be ready to create an antibacterial or a treatment for it? It's a challenge to her. So yeah, all these things keep me up at night and I think we should keep all scientists at night, up at night. I wanna piggyback on what Alan said. I think this very, very, very simple idea that like as soon as you have data, you need ways to integrate this data. And we know from like, you know, uh, lots of recent Nobel Prize winning work, how humans are very bad at integrating diverse kinds of data. It's very easy for us to be biased. And, um, you know, so I think the, um, like the fastest way, like what holds us back is poor decisions. What holds us back is like bad answers to good questions. And what holds us back is not making the decisions at all, taking decisions at all to begin with. So in some sense, like, it seems extremely easy to believe that like pretty much in all walks of life in any business, like, whether it's science, business, engineering, like the amount of data is exploding. We have more and more ways to measure. And so in some sense, AI is kind of, AI ML is really the science of enabling sound decision-making using large amounts of data. Yeah. Right. Uh, Pinda, I, I'm interested to ask you to come in on this. I mean, one thing I'm, Sort of hearing in the way Alan and Suchi talked about there is sort of maybe there's some advice there for people in the audience who you know haven't started using these techniques yet but it's going to happen it sounds like you need a certain amount of humility almost in rethinking your process uh, yeah I felt like you touched on that in your opening remarks yeah I mean it, this is it, to build on what everyone's uh, talking about here is if you don't adopt the AI, you're going to be at a major disadvantage of people that are adopting it. And, and a really good example that I could think of that's happening in the art field is, you know, traditionally for as long as I can remember, there's prints. And uh, with these prints, you, you know, an artist will put out a, a single painting and, or piece of art and they'll make 100 prints. And that's a good way of keeping the studio moving and supported because you have your major piece of art, but you can only sell one of those once in a while. But then you have your prints that gets to the medium sized audience. A new massively popular trend is to use AI to make generative art prints. And these are going to be, instead of like, you know, an edition of 100 where you have 100 identical um, images, AI will make 100 different images and will number them as an edition series. And so all of a sudden you're at this bigger, you have a more attractive piece of art where it's unique. People can buy editions, same amount of work by the artist, but it's, it's a unique new kind of piece of art. And everyone that buys one of these editions has the advantage of having a unique piece of art. And, you know, that's just one application. So many applications. I, I loved what Alon said about, um, took a long time to set up. Um, it took, you know, it took me 15 years to get to this point with my robots. But now if, if I have another painting, I, I can be up and running in half an hour. And then I can go hang out with my kids uh, and check on it every four or five hours. Um, 
it's unbelievably give me an unbelievable advantage uh, over other artists making original art. Um, I do not think they will ever replace us. Uh, I think it's always going to be that directorial. I, I explained that three tier thing. I direct, it does the technical and a lot of the creativity. And then I, I assist it with things it needs like switching brushes and, and uh, adding and mixing the paints. I'm hoping that I could just be directing, you know, five years from now, I'm just directing. I love, I love what I heard about the, you know, natural speech processing, talking to them. It's like, Hey, it's a little red. Why don't you tone that down? I would love to be able to do that. I see that happening in five years. Let's collaborate, man. Let's collaborate. Yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. Okay. Um, well, all of you, thanks for indulging me in this uh, conversation. We now are going to move to audience Q&A. Um, some of you have already put questions in. I encourage all of the rest of you to put in more into the Q&A function on the bottom of the Zoom screen. I think it's right in the middle. Um, and uh, try and stick to questions not comments we that way we'll be able to get through as many as possible uh okay let me flick back to my list here um oh wow i have plenty to choose from um okay well here's one primarily for suchi but i think maybe we could bring everyone in on it um you mentioned that i think it was 30 percent or a third of uh either deaths or bad health outcomes are due to misdiagnosis someone here has written you know uh, AI should be beneficial to society in reducing that, but how will people now doing diagnosis respond to the need to find new jobs? Um, uh, do you ever run into opposition uh, against using AI in medicine? Uh, it sounds like you've been thinking about some of these challenges already, Suji. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So I think, um, I, so I've now spent uh, 12 years across three large health systems, Stanford, Harvard, and Hopkins. And in my experience, I've never seen a single provider worry, a physician, clinician, worry about not having enough to do. If anything, they have way too much to do and not enough time to do it all. Um, their, you know, patient complexity has increased dramatically. They have the same amount of time to analyze way more data to take care of patients that are far more complex. And so in some sense, they're like, clamoring for tools that will make the jobs easier and better and easy, uh, like more joyful compared to what they have access to today. And will anyone need to find a new job? Uh, it's a very common and logical way of thinking, but uh, you know, I have written a bit about economic studies that tried to figure out whether AI is displacing people from jobs. And it's pretty hard to find hard evidence for it. What, what do you see in your field? I mean, are there going to be people doing jobs today that are they don't work in healthcare anymore because the technology comes through or, or will they find different jobs? I, I think in medicine, at least what I see is the roles changing. In fact, I see the roles improving, right? Like when people go into medicine, the reason they're going in is because they love caring for patients. They love caring for people. But unfortunately, the job has gone away from being caring to being buried in a screen, staring at things. So if anything, I see roles returning and coming back to something that I see my uh, clinician uh, peers and friends uh, want so desperately, which is being able to use the time to actually provide the things that humans are uniquely able to do, which is the human touch and being able to like use the data to then practice more effectively. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, let's move on to another question. Here's one for the, the GAN fathers, uh, Pindar and Alan. Has anyone compared GANs to right and left cortical networks with the right being generative and the left uh, adversarial? Uh, this is apparently something explained in a book called The Master and Is a Mystery by Ian McGilchrist. I know the two of you are big fans of GANs and uh, Pindar, you have some thoughts about sort of how they, how they operate or how there's anal analogies to our own thinking. I was talking to Alon earlier. We're all talking. About, I'd love to hear him repeat what he told me earlier because I was really. But yeah, I think there's 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 lots of interest in Kurzweil. I read about it in Kurzweil. Like uh, I forget the exact name of the book, but Making a Mind, I think it was called. But he talks about how there's people that you can prove that we have multiple minds because there's people that their hemispheres of their brains have been separated because of epilepsy, so they're not talking with each other as much as they might in in my brain or or someone who hasn't had their hemispheres changed. Um, and so there is this back and forth where they're working with each other. Um, and, but I think I, I most want to, I want to see this to, I'll, I'll say my viewpoint on it. And, then, and I'll, I'll like, I'd love to hear Alon tell, retell me what he told uh, me earlier, but 
they seem like they're when I look at these images and I see GANs generating images and and things going in and out and, and it's it seems like that's how my brain works. It just seems so familiar. And my GAN work is really popular for that reason because people just see something in there that they recognize, but they have no idea why they've recognized it. For someone that's never done hallucinogens before, it probably looks like a hallucination. Um, and I don't know why, and I don't understand it. I just know that it's visually interesting in that way, psychedelic almost. Yeah, yeah. Alan, I'd be interested to hear your, your thoughts on this. I mean, and what we're talking about here is, you know, less the specifics of exactly how does it work, but also, you know, how do you think about the way these systems operate and, and, and generate, right? Well, it's, it, we oh. humans, you know, we make sense of the world by having mental models of what process, how processes work and how other people think and how animals think. And I guess now we have to apply it to these systems if we're going to use them productively. Okay, so let me let me just tell the analogy I was telling Tinder on the on the pre pre meeting. Uh, I I recommend people to think about the movie Blade Runner, right? In Blade Runner, uh, there is this androids that are trying to pass as humans, and if you want to pass as a human, right? So the the Blade Runner doesn't kill you. You have to kind of look at the behavior of humans and sample from the distribution. So there's always a chance that I'm gonna be scratching my head. How often? I don't know. How exactly? Who knows? But you see a human doing this kind of uh, behavior and suddenly you get convinced that's a human and not a robot. This is the reason why GANs are gonna be so, and, and generative models in general are so important for robots to try to pass as humans, like in the West world, right? Otherwise the robot will look so stiff because it's not you know, behaving like us virtually. So that's, I like to tell, the, tell that really what they're doing is sampling from a probability distribution of things they have seen. In the case of Pindar, is paintings. In the case of sushi, maybe it's treatments. In my case, is experimental conditions for chemistry, right? Are they truly creative? Are they really how our brain works? There are some analogies, but of course there are some differences. I think what our brain has that they don't is conceptual relationships and causal networks that are coming from different areas of AI. So I think what my group and I are about to put a paper in the archive that we think it's very important, uh, whose title is in parallel something, do androids think of scientific concepts, is talking about that gap where AI is not gonna be enough as we use it right now in terms of deep learning. And we need to add other yeah. layers of AI to make this even more transformational, okay? So stay tuned for this paper on the archive, but a preview is, can an AI see some data and discover a new scientific concept? What is needed to get there? It's something that I've been struggling uh, for the last couple of years. And we've been writing a paper literally for two years on more of the philosophy of this and also what will be the tools necessary. So I, I don't know, this kind of gives you an idea of where the GANs are and the autoencoders and all these generative models. But there is a conceptual step forward towards a more general science intelligence that we need. Yeah, okay, you heard it here first, log on to the archive uh, and look out for that in the future. Um, just a uh, note to the audience here, we probably have about five more minutes or so. Uh, there's still time to get your question into the Q&A box and I will do my best to get to it. Um, okay, here's another one about medicine, Suchi. How do we reconcile the current thinking of precision medicine and individual treatment to the way that machine learning operates typically using very large scale data from population right so when you use this huge aggregate data how do you turn that into something that is specific to an individual maybe even their genetics um you know at the super specific level um so i think this is one of the big myths that's in the uh, sort of popular media around the idea that like the way ml would be applied to complex domains like medicine is to take this massive, you know, black box model, take crazy amounts of data, put it to this black box model, you get something that you don't understand how it works, you get something ultra complicated, you have no idea how to explain what it's doing, and then you apply it and magically it's just going to solve all of life's problem, including medicine. That has not been my experience. I don't believe that approach is going to work. I think the people who are applying that approach are taking a V1 rudimentary approach. And I don't believe I've seen any data that shows the, any uh, evidence that that direction is going to succeed. On the contrary, I think what is uh, what we believe 
is going to uh, issuing promise and issuing evidence for is effectively ideas that um, are actually very motivated by small data problems. Uh, back in 2016, I gave this uh, talk, um, a TEDx Boston talk, where I talked about how medicine is very much a small data and a big data problem. So it's a, a small data and a big data problem in the sense that you have data from a lot of different patients, but any given patient is kind of, there are a small number of patients around that patient. So you, you really have to think about it as um, not just sort of big black box averages you're learning across millions of people, but really what about this patient makes, like who are the other patients like this patient? What can we learn to transfer? at varying levels of the hierarchy. So um, uh, just sort of as a, I mean, hard to talk about this in any one pointer, but we have a, a NeurIPS paper that was published in 2016, where I talked about this idea of like multi-resolution structure and like generalization and transfer learning at multi-resolution. But basically, if you think about a patient, there's, you know, transfer that happens at the level of patients with similar diseases, patients with similar, uh, you know, racial history, socioeconomic history, but then also in a given patient using their historical data, you can learn something about how this patient tends to differ from a typical patient of this type. So there's transfer happening at the level of within patient, across patient groups, across populations. And, and that has, um, and so in some sense, you're just like any smart human would, right? You're trying to learn the most you can. And you're trying to learn the most you can at every level. There are things you can learn at scale. And there are things you can learn at the level of like for a given person after watching them for some period of time. How does this person tend to deviate from their group? And, and I think the right techniques and tools will have to implement these ideas. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I think we've got time for one last question, which is uh, kind of thinking about well, what can go wrong? You know, can this technology lead you astray? So um, I think there's been more awareness in recent years of potential for a system to be biased. You know, maybe you train a system on a set of data that represents one population. When you use it on another, it, it will have some maybe uh, unwanted results. Uh, the qu person who asked this question gave the example of, you know, corrupt police or, um, you know, maybe medical practice is, is wrong if that's the data you're training the system on. Um, could it lead you astray? Uh, Alain, in, in, do you think about this in the context of science? Like, how do you yeah. exp encourage people to think critically about what the system is telling them, look out for this stuff? Well, yeah, we have to be very careful. We, we, I mean, the vision that we have is that the way 3D printers exist already, right? Like people print any three-dimensional object, we will have access to 3D printing, the equivalent of molecular structures, molecules on demand. Now imagine all the ethical problems that could happen if suddenly what I'm doing is trying to print a poison or print, mm. you know, uh, some sort of, you know, thing like that, right? So we have to have all this ethical thinking about when humanity has this power of making molecules on demand, what would that mean to, what would that mean to, to, to the world? And as always, like, I mean, it's the same thing as nuclear power or fusion, <laughs> Uh, you know, like these things could be used very badly or very well, right? And fusion could be a, our ne next source of energy, but you could also make a, a bomb out of it and things like that. So I think in, in the AI-driven science field, we have to figure out if we accelerate science, what could be dangerous? And also how can we make sure it's, it's, it's okay? Right, okay. I'd, I'd love to add a point of view if there's a 30 seconds. Um, so I think um, it's true. I think um, basically in medicine, for example, when you look at uh, clinical practice today, um, it's biased in a number of ways. I think there's lots and lots of papers in the last couple of years, as there's been more emphasis on data and on the topic of bias, how people are like finding new examples. Like very recently, there was an example about pulse oximetry. It's something that's used, uh, you know, to measure ox uh, oxysat levels and determine if a person is hypoxemic. Practice that's been around forever but it was originally developed calibrated on white patients and it's actually is therefore as a result under diagnosis hypo hypoxemia in black patients. I, I'm just giving you one example, there are hundreds of examples like this. So where I'm going with it is like, first of all, humans are biased, human decision-making is biased. As a result, any domain where you're collecting data from just observing humans, you're gonna get biased data sets. To do it all, to do it, but I think 
um, we can develop methods. In fact, there's been a plethora of new methods, including some that we've had to develop in the course of our own work in uh, correcting for these biases. It's actually like you can, there are so many strategies for correcting for biases and you can lead to tools that actually uh, at the end of the day, if done right, the key part is if done right, help not hurt and improve actually over current practice. Okay, yeah, a good note to end on realistic optimism. Um, <laughs> thank you, Suchi, and uh, all of our panelists, Pindar and Alan as well. Uh, this is the end of the session. Uh, thanks also to the audience members who threw questions to the Q&A. Um, thank you very much.